and welcome to Season 1 of the new series, Teaching Matters, on the Psych Sessions Network. This series is co-hosted by Dr. Rob McIntarfer, who serves as an assessment specialist for the Lincoln Public School System in Lincoln, Nebraska, and me, Eric Landrum, your humble podcast servant from Boise State University and co-founder of Psych Sessions. Rob and I, well, we had a blast recording these chats, 12 episodes in all in season one, including this brief introductory episode. Episodes two through 12 range in length from 16 minutes to 35 minutes each. So they are meant to be bite-sized, suitable for binge listening if you wish. Oh, we ramble quite a bit, and at times you might laugh with us or laugh at us. Honestly, we don't care which. Please know that the viewpoints expressed here represent Rob and Eric's own opinions respectively and not the opinions of their individual employers. As we discuss teaching matters, we hope these conversations will be provocative and thought-provoking. If you have ideas for future episode topics or want to comment, most podcast outlets allow for comments or you can email us at psychsessionspodcast at gmail.com. Now, I will put that email address in the liner notes for each episode show notes but here it is again all one word psych sessions podcast at gmail.com thank you so much for listening and enjoy season one of teaching matters jumping way back earlier in our conversation your conversation about the handshake thing made me think about norms The handshake norm was so deeply established that I'm with you. I just have trouble imagining not shaking someone's hand again. Although social norms do change over time. And if anything's going to change a norm, you'd think it'd be this. We might be able to apply that same thing to what were our norms in face-to-face teaching that may need to change? And what were our norms in face-to-face faculty meetings that need to change? They need to get replaced? Do they need to... That might be useful. And over time, norms have certainly changed. I was going to say for better, for worse. And I guess this is for better and worse. When I meet with students, when I used to meet face-to-face with students for advising, if they had a concern either as chair or as a faculty member, I never shut my office door. Yeah. Just as a measure of respect, but also as a measure of, I just don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable that a student has come into my office, and I'm talking about college students now, then I have shut the door just so that anyone, make sure every, anyone doesn't feel hinky about that. At best, pre-COVID, to congratulate a student, I, I would shake their hand. They got into graduate school. They got a paper accepted at Rocky Mountain Psychological Association or a poster, I would shake their hand. I wouldn't give them a hug. In fact, I might say to them, you've done a great job and I will be more than happy to give you a big old hug right <laughs> after you graduate. <laughs> sure. I mean, to, to, to really drive the point home that while you're my student, that's not going to happen. Or uh, send me a Facebook friend request right after you graduate kind of thing, just to have that professional distance. And those were things that I was doing pre-COVID. And I don't think any, I don't think other people have to follow my rules. I think those rules are different for different people at different stages in their careers. I think they're different for male faculty and female faculty. I don't prescribe anything for anyone else. So those are just things I follow. And within the context of social norms, then we've got our own individual rules for how we behave, but then we have some rules for how we behave that we may not even be aware of. And maybe some of those, if we make ourselves aware of them, we can find substitutes that's u- that are useful in a virtual environment. One of the ones that I think about is in a face-to-face, I'm sure communications people and social psych folks have all sorts of research on this that I'm not aware of, but the nonverbal cues we use with each other about who's talking next and who's done talking and affect cues and things like that. I'm sure I'm not aware of a lot of those until I go to a multi-person virtual conference and I just don't know how to break in. I don't know when to break in. I end up using, I think, just switching to different tactics like raising my hand in my office when I'm alone on camera which feels dumb, but seems effective. Sometimes when I'm talking over someone else, I'm interrupting them. I 
clamp my hand over my mouth physically so they can see that I didn't mean to. And I think some of that subtle social norm stuff, we just may need some new indicators for tasks that have to get done. And that, boy, just think about the classroom implications of that. And you've done this, and a lot of teachers have done this. You just had to figure out with a group of people when you want them cognitively involved, but they're all little windows and you can only see some of them. How do you do that? Yeah, I'm doing another uh, a podcast series with three delightful individuals. One includes Susan Nolan, and we are figuring this out because I know Susan very well, but the other two tremendous psychologists, Asani and Yinka, I, I don't know very well at all. And four squares on a video screen recording the audio, we've figured out there needs to be a cue. There needs to be, I've got a point to make and I, I want to get in there. Now, there are software versions of doing this. For example, we're in the middle of Zencaster right now. And I just clicked on a button that sent you a message that says Psych Sessions has something to say. Right. And you can raise and lower your hand like that. Right. Especially if you were in a big screen with a bunch of people, that could be helpful to use. But you're exactly right. And the other thing that I I know I do, I've actually read some articles about this, how it's a little bit goofy, but I can't help myself at the end of a Zoom call, whether it's two people on the screen or the end of a faculty meeting, I wave and say goodbye. It seems awkward to me to not signal goodbye before I click leave meeting. I, I do the same thing. And I would don't think I did that in a face-to-face -face meeting. I don't think I waved wildly at the end of a face-to-face -face meeting before I no, walked. But you said room. goodbye. You said, yeah. see you later. Goodbye. Yeah. There was some sort of closing yeah. salutation. Right. But the All wave, right, see, see you next time. See you next week. Good yeah, to see you. The physical wave thing on on, visual, on on camera conferences is a thing, but I don't know why. The other thing I'm, well, noticing, I, I'm noticing another maybe social norm or maybe just indicator that I'm missing. I'm noticing it during this call. I'm conscious of the fact that this is recorded and most people will probably be listening to it. But also when we're looking at each other, I get the illusion that you're looking at me, but I'm not sure about that because sometimes I'm looking at myself on the screen and I suspect you might be doing the same thing. So a lot of what you're saying, I want to indicate that I agree with or resonate with. Normally, if we were face to face, I'd just be nodding or leaning forward. Right. I have no confidence that those visual cues would be effective. So I find myself, I think I've got a little tick where I say, yeah, uh-huh, okay, yeah, you bet, something like that. But <laughs> as you have to listen to this and other people are listening to this, that might be super annoying where I'm just interrupting every once in a while with, yeah, yeah. So now I'm trying to stop. When I go back and listen to some of the earliest recordings in year one and year two where Garth and I were doing this, I cringe because I, I did that way more than I needed to. I didn't need to go... Yes, that's right. Because I was in I was interrupting the flow of the person I was interviewing. And I, I think it's a good idea sometimes to give that person a breath, to give that person a chance to catch their breath. But this medium is not intuitive for most people. It takes practice. It takes time. And interviewing is a skill that I did not have when I started that has been acquired over time. And to be really honest with you, Garth is really good at it. And I don't listen in a proud way, not in a jealous way. Garth is way better at it than I am. If you listen to him and you listen to his questioning, and he is really quite good at it. He's developed a technique that's all his own. He could teach the master class in it. He's really quite good. The oh, I was going to say something else. The other thing that I've been reading about in online articles, the trick if you can do it is to... so. You've got an image on your screen and then you've got your camera and they're not next to one another, but ideally they should be as close as possible. And what I try to do, which is really awkward, Rob, obviously I want to see you. I want to look at what you're doing. I'm really not that interested in seeing me, quite honestly, but I want to see you, but I've got you in a frame on a screen, but, and then I've got my camera actually right above my screen. I've got it set up 
where it's actually popping up and over my screen to get relatively close. But what the experts say is, and they tell you, this is awkward and it takes practice. Don't look at the screen, look at the camera lens. Obviously our listeners aren't gonna get this, but here's me looking at you on the screen. And then here's me making eye yeah. contact with you, right. looking at the camera. Do you, is there a difference? There absolutely is a difference. How about uh, me looking at you right now? Do you see that? Here's me looking yeah. at the screen and then I'm looking at the camera. And okay, so that's very subtle. And honestly, you, you've got it set up where your lens and your camera are, are your the lens of your camera and your screen must be very close to one another. Yep. It's just a laptop. So it's right above it. And that's, it's really subtle. I'm sure it's effective. I don't know how it feels to you. It feels awkward to me. I'm trying to stare straight down the barrel of the lens of the camera right now. And it feels weird because your head starts about an inch lower. So it feels very strange. It feels like I'm talking to my computer and not talking to my friend, Eric. That's because I've got a big melon. It might be different <laughs> with people with a smaller head without so much glare coming, you know, right here from the light above. And that's the other thing people are doing to their credit. They're buying ring lights. They're doing lighting. They're buying nice microphones. They're upgrading. And maybe that's another lesson out of COVID that some educators are paying attention to the quality of their audio, the quality of their video, the quality of uh, narrated PowerPoint slides and the materials that they're putting out there, which I think is a good thing. There's a reference. I believe her name is Barbara Oakley. I was just looking for her book, got somewhere. I got to attend a virtual conference and she gave one of the keynotes and she apparently has an online class that is one of the largest online classes or most popular online classes out there. And the whole last part of the talk was technical stuff about ring lights, camera position, background, framing, and some data about effectiveness of learning. So she might be worth looking at. Yeah. And I mean, the effectiveness of learning, that would be really amazing. I, I'd be a little bit surprised if it was dramatic, but I definitely think the professionalism matters. And perhaps it's just role modeling for our students that it's worth our effort to look professional and sound professional and be professional. They're worth that effort. And for a lot of our colleagues, if they're recording their history notes or their research methods notes one time and posting them on YouTube or their LMS, that's a great investment because they don't have to do it again, probably. Yeah, absolutely. The care that we maybe without a whole lot of conscious thought put into being in a room with students, what this might go back to norms or it might go back to pedagogy. What's the equivalent of that care with an online presentation? Yeah. And I'll just mention one other thing that's a little bit tangential, but it was unexpected. Years ago, when I kind of decided to flip classes, I, I recorded a bunch of, I took my regular PowerPoint slides. I didn't chop them up smaller, like the literature says to do. I, I took my regular kind of 45 minute lectures in like a capstone class, a research methods class, intro to the psych major class. And I did audio voiceovers of a narrated PowerPoint, essentially, and just posted them to YouTube. And actually, they're still there now. And I have a YouTube channel, Eric Landrum, and Rob, I have almost 2,000 subscribers. <laughs> That's fantastic. And that channel has over a quarter million views. Wow. That's amazing. I don't advertise it. It doesn't have advertising. It doesn't have ads. Oh, I have SPSS videos, tutorial videos. Most of them are five minutes or less. I have APA videos, APA formatting videos. It's, you know, and I just made them for Boise State students. I didn't, I had no, I had no intention of, I'm going to make videos for a national or international audience. So I, I think it's one of these things where I, I think it's like Steve Chu's video, videos, but not nearly as popular. He made these how to study videos with the help of the tech department at Sanford. And he's literally become world famous because of it. 
I'm not world famous because of it, <laughs> but that channel is shockingly popular. I would have never imagined a quarter million views. In my history of psych uh, section, my playlist, there's like a video of uh, 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 a narrated PowerPoint, Wundt and the Founding of Psychology, that has 50,000 views. That's amazing. Isn't that fantastic? It, it's fantastic. And also, I want to say troubling, it's, <laughs> um, or it's just mind boggling the need. I'm surprised that the need for content is out there. Earlier, we were talking about what is the value added of in-person and online and what works well online in a teaching situation versus an, an in-person situation versus an online situation. And obviously, those data are part of the answer. A whole bunch of people are getting a lot out of your online, strictly asynchronous online, no interaction. So part of the answer is a hell of a lot learning can happen online even asynchronously. I've often thought that, let's say I'm going to circle back to research methods and teach that class. First off, I've recorded all my stuff, but now it's out of date. But why would I, why would I re-record it all again? If I had the time and bandwidth, I should just cruise YouTube and find everyone who's done the same thing that I've done, which I, what I've done is not unique. And find the best lecture narrated PowerPoint out there on between groups designs and drop that into my course. I should curate the best materials on each topic, curate the best materials on correlation versus causation, drop it into my course. Regan Gurung at Oregon State was teaching research methods at the undergraduate level in the last term. And he was mentioning to me in a conversation not that long ago, he was going to be gone one week. He, he had a commitment. And I can't remember what topic he was going to talk about in research methods. And I told him, you should just go to my YouTube site and drop in my video. And I think he said, oh, I'll look into that or something. But in some ways, I, I know we pay instructors to create the content and then to teach it. But the content's created. Yeah. Not every yeah. instructor writes their own book. Why would every instructor create their own lectures? What that makes me think of is, and apologies, I should have told you, I do need to wrap up quickly after this, but that makes me think of apparently Bill McKeechee at Michigan in the intro class. I hope I'm getting the story. He used to tell intro psych students, buy whatever textbook you can find, make it within X year to X year, but bring whatever textbook you would find. And then he would deliberately have them compare and contrast concepts across textbooks your idea makes me think maybe we can do something similar with curated videos. Maybe there are you could have a variety of different things out there for students and then deliberately show how to evaluate what you're seeing. And that could be deeper processing for students. Absolutely. And not only did Bill McKeechee do that, but Regan actually did a study oh, cool. within the past 10 years where he had... He actually did the same thing with, I think, a series of six different intro psych books and looked at learning outcomes on common tests. Neat. Partner, 